Good evening. It's a good way to start a Sunday evening and good to see all of you out there. Make sure that when you're watching that you send a little note every once in a while. You say, I just don't want to watch anything, write anything. Punch one of them little buttons at the bottom and do something. It'll show your picture that you're there with us, but we can tell anyhow, but we're glad to have you with us and where you are. going to sing. We, we don't ever, ever, ever do this song at our church, you know, but uh, just for Allison, we're going to sing tonight all three verses of Come Thou Found. Wandering from the fold of God, He to rescue me from danger, interposed His precious love. Oh, to grace how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let Thy goodness, like a fetter, by my wandering heart to Thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it through Thy cross of love. Oh. That's a great song, isn't it? Allison loved it, and all the rest of us, we love singing all the verses instead of just the first one. We have a song tonight that's going to go along with the message, and uh, written by a friend of ours, Miss Brenda and me, and I don't remember the first time I met him, but uh, Johnny Flanagan and his wife used to travel all over the country, and we still pray for him. But he wrote a song about when we're going through problems here, we always got to remember that we are pilgrims passing through there. And that's not exactly what the Bible verse he took it out of says. For it says, when we were dead in sins, he hath quickened us together with Christ by grace you're saved, and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Then in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Already over on the other side. I'm already over on the other side Waiting for my brand new body Sitting in there in heavenly spare In the eyes of my heavenly father My citizenship's in heaven I'm sitting in Christ to see I'm already over on the other side Waiting for my body to be when I talk to people down here, they'll tell me all about their problems. They ask me how I smile and sing. If you're talking about troubles, I got them. But when the devil tries to take my joy away from me, I just remember where I'm at and where I'm going to be. When I look at the old black book, it thrills me through and through. If you've been saved and born again, then it will thrill you too. I was reading about going home and found to my surprise. I'm already there in Jesus' arms, 
in my father's eyes i'm already over on the other side waiting on my brand new body sitting there in heavenly fair in the eyes of my heavenly father my citizenship in heaven i'm sitting in christ you see i'm already over on the other side waiting for my body to be let the heathen rage come what may none can bother me to this old world i'm crucified in the christ on calvary after three old days he was raised again and i'm in christ justified so being then made dead to sin i'm living on the other side i'm already over on the other side waiting on my brand new body sitting there in the heavenly fair in the eyes of my heavenly father my citizenship in heaven i'm sitting in christ you see i'm already over on the other side waiting for my body to be here's a verse for you that goes along with what we're going through ready now if you've been regretting or thinking about quitting or falling by the way so you've already passed from death to life so you might as well just stay the battle's fought the victory's won it's finished our lord cried he made us more than conquerors living on the other side i'm already over on the other side waiting on my brand new body sitting there in a heavenly fair in the eyes of my heavenly father my citizenship in heaven i'm waiting in christ to see i'm already over on the other side waiting on my body to be well welcome to our sunday evening service and i hope you enjoyed listening to that song by johnny flanagan as much as we did in singing it and if you think you and we had fun on the edition you seen you should have seen what went on before i love those songs little happy stuff but they remind us of something and it goes along with my sermon tonight i told you this morning what i was going to be preaching about and that is what i have right now uh in the book of romans chapter number eight we're going to read a few verses probably familiar to most of you but i want you to look at them with me and we start reading in verse 28 it says we know that all things work together for good to them that love god to them who are the called according to his purpose for whom he did foreknow he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren you can solve all that predestination stuff this way okay ready everybody that's saved is predestinated to be conformed to the image of christ you can start working on it in the world but what you don't get done here, God will take care of when He makes us all and changes our body and we're with Him. We'll all be changed in the moment, the twinkling of an eye. Verse 30, Moreover, whom He did predestinate, him, them He also called. Whom He called, He also justified. Whom He justified, He also glorified. That sounds like good stuff, doesn't it? What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not His Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how should he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, even who even is at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And 
If you look through those things, you'll find there are about 20 different things in that little portion of Scripture that we already possess in Christ Jesus. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight, about what I already have. Now, I, I know the world that I live in, and I know what the world does. The world wants everything right now. They disdain Christians. The world is because we, they say, well, you give up for the present gains for a chance to get something better at a later time. In a little bit of that, they're, they're true, okay? But we're not a chance. We have an absolute because I'm depending on the promise of God. And the Bible says that God's promises never fail. On the other hand, those same people that argue about giving up something now for something later will work for years and years and years and exercise and do things and all that kind of stuff because they'll say, you know, you got to do this to get this. You got to have your health. Well, guys, listen to me. It works both in the physical world and it works in the spiritual world. Paul said this. The, that statement that we're giving up everything for what we don't know is, is not really even a half-truth, but I wrote it down for you to see because Paul said, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of life that now is and that which is to come. Now listen to what he said. He said, not just we've, we're putting all this stuff aside because we're going to have something better. He said that now is and that which is to come. This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. Now for that we're grateful. Christianity and Christians have uh, been shortchanged by the world. There, a lot of people think that we're, I don't know what we're trying to do, and for years and years I, I left home and let, went into the ministry and people who knew me, when I'd go back home, I actually had a guy about 10 years after I was in the ministry, he had been one of my former employee, employers, and he said, uh, George, isn't your time about up? And I said, what do you mean? And some, I, he wasn't very religious of anything, but I, I guess he thought we had like Mormons, we'd go on a four-year mission or a two-year mission. or, or we like. And I said, no, this is a lifetime event for me. I'm going to serve God with my life till I die, if he'll let me. But he said, and I guess in his mind, he's thinking, wow, what a sacrifice. I have not seen it that way. I have not seen it that way. I want you to understand something. A lot of people say this. Don't ever take it wrong. We get tired in the ministry. Boy, this is hard work. We never get tired of the ministry. I have a good friend of mine. He's preached in our church and I love him. And he's an older than me. And he said, you know what? When I first quit pre pastoring, I sort of lost my identity. You know why? Because we love it. We love what we do. I used to tell the church, and I don't say it much anymore. I'm afraid they'll fire me now. But anyhow, but I said, you can fire me. I'll, I'll go, I'll, I won't have no job next week, and I won't, may not have a job the next week. You come back in two months, I'll be pastoring the church somewhere. Because that's what God called me to do. I don't feel like I've done that much of a sacrifice. But I will tell you this. I have everything to gain and nothing to lose by serving God. And I remember that verse that Paul gave us. He said, this time and the time to come. The Christian has a lot of things in their life right now. I mean, right now we have a lot of things. The ignorance the world believes and spreads is that Christians have no treasure now. We have to be like poverty stricken. Well, that's not true. Almost everybody I know who really serves God with all their heart has as much and more God divides to whom He will as He decides than they'll need. Christians do give up something right now, though. They really do give up something. I gave up going to hell and all the things that go along with going to hell, including not being able to have victory over my own flesh. And I've told you my testimony Guys, I'm telling you, as soon as I trusted the Lord as my Savior, what I'd never been able to do on my own all my life, the Lord did for me when He helped me get a victory over some of those things in my life that were destroying my life. I want you to get that. Do I still live in the flesh? You betcha. Hang around me a lot and you'll, you'll see that. But I gave up separation from God. I gave up living without hope. I gave up being totally controlled by the wicked flesh and by the one who controls the flesh in the world. I gave up the inability to please God. 
But the Bible says, you know, in my flesh, there, thereby is no good thing. Christians do give up something, but everything they give up is a gain for them when it comes to the things of Christ. Christians do live in hope. Do you understand that? We have a treasured promise of heaven. And part of that promise starts right now in us. And Paul said in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 6, that by two immutable things, which is impossible for God to lie, we have a strong consolation. I have a strong consolation. I like, we, we don't have to sorrow, sir. I've lost out totally. I still have a treasure. We'll show you that in a minute. Who had fled to refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Not bouncing around in the world as if we had no, we have a destination. We're pointed toward it. Did you, ever, did you ever notice what Jesus said? He said, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. We, we know who we are. We know where we're going. And we know what we have. Both sure and steadfast. You know why? Because it's from God, assured by God, provided by God, which entereth into that within the veil. You know what he said? He was making a picture type to those people who understood that inside that holy of holies was the picture type of the presence of God. And he said, that's where our anchor holds. It holds inside the very presence of God. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But that doesn't mean he's not with us here. What do you say? What do you think that means? Well, number one, let me show you what I got right now. I have a new birth. For as much as you know, you are not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. What could you buy with gold? Anything you buy with gold has to be worldly. What can you buy a soul with? David said the redemption of a man's soul was precious. You know what he meant? It don't happen but once. And that's through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not received by tradition of your fathers or any kind of religion, but verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot, who was verily foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Now watch what he had to say. Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. You see what he said we could do? We could love each other. Seeing that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now look at this. Being born again. Here's the key to it, guys. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. I have a new birth. I have a new birth. And in that new birth, it means this. I was not a child of God naturally. Because the Bible says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And sometimes I've had people say, Well, preacher, what, do you, what does that mean? I said, that thinking that a lost man could understand the things of Christ is as foolish as believing that the man laying in a casket at a burial ground could re raise up and go, These are nice flowers you guys bought. He doesn't know the flowers are there because he's not there. He's dead. And when we're lost, we don't recognize God and we don't understand God. We can't, the only thing we hope, have hope is is to believe in God and then God saves us and we become new creatures. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Number two, he said, I'm, I was born again. What do I have right now? I was born again, trusting in Christ Jesus. Not by all my own merit. Paul said that. For in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Romans 7, 18. And I keep the law. Was never made it personal with me. You understand that? When, my, when I was younger, my dad would plead with me to, just to be good. Why can't you just be good? And I would ask him questions and he wasn't. He, he wasn't Christian then or didn't have the answers. And I found the answer when I found Christ. It, it's not keeping the law that justifies me. It was knowing Christ as the Savior who could help me with the flesh that I could not control and give me the Spirit on the inside to have the power to finally be and do what God wanted me to do.
The verses say this in Romans chapter 3, verse 20. It says, Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Read the Ten Commandments. See how many of them make you righteous. Verse 21 says, But now the righteousness of the God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. This is what they prophesy. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there's no difference. That's what he meant. Peter would put it another day, way. He'd say, being born again, not a corruptible seed, not this time of the flesh, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Number two, the law was broken. Everybody but Jesus broke the law. That's what Peter said in Acts 15 when they were saying they ought to get the Gentiles to keep the law. He said, why would you put on them what we've never been able to do? The law was our schoolmaster. You know what that means? It had one purpose, and that was to bring us to Christ. That's what Galatians 3 says. For the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. I have a new birth. I'm a child of God. I'm born again. And see, look at this. I became that when I received Christ as my personal Savior. Do you understand that I'm not being saved? I am saved. We're saved by the blood of Christ once and for all. Right now, I know whom I believe. I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I'm as saved as I'm ever going to get. And when I'm saved, I can trust the word of God for what it says. It reinforces that. Whosoever believeth in me shall never die, trusting in his promises. Whosoever is called upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Receiving the gift of God, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should have everlasting life. I have a new birth. I have a new nature. I have a new nature. I have a new nature. Second Peter chapter number 1, verse 4. Wherefore they have given unto us exceeding and great and precious promises. Now I want you to get this. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Can you get that? Can you get that? Deluded people believe they might be gods. But I'm telling you, every Christian can right now have the attributes of God in them because when you're born again, you become a child of God. You say, well, preacher, I know a lot of people that are saved and they don't act like gods. I know it. It's a matter of growth in that thing, but the possibilities there, guys. We're all going to be human, still have the flesh here. Remember what Paul said about no good thing in my flesh? Hang on to that thought, will you? Because it's important. But I can tell you what I have right now. I have a new nature in Christ. Romans chapter 8. If any man be in Christ, he's new creatures, what the scripture says, but then Romans chapter 8 says, in the flesh, no man can please God. I have, to, I have a new nature because I come to Christ as my Savior, and He saved me, sealed my soul, and that new nature is the nature of God. That's what Peter just said. Having escaped the corruptions that is in the world through lust, how do we do it? Because we're sealed by that same Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1 Verse 12 through 14. You knew me after you believed you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. I'm led by that same Spirit. How many times did Jesus say, when the Comforter comes, when He comes, when He comes, He's going to teach you, train you, lead you, remind you. That's one of the great things. That Spirit of God deals with me. The, back to that Romans chapter 8. He said, if any man have not the Spirit of God, he's none of his. Can I tell you, that that same spirit that came into my life and sealed my soul has never quit working, not only on me on the inside, but me on the outside. We ought to be able to see it. Now, I know you got your Bible because we started out there in Romans chapter 8. And I want you to go back with me one more time. My new nature in Christ allows us to live the characteristics of our Heavenly Father, this new nature. Look at Romans chapter number 8. You're already there. Now I want you to look back at verse 1, 2, 3, and 4. 
There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. This is a wonderful thing. Lost people don't get it, and most saved people don't get it. Before you were saved, you had no choice. Jesus said, ye are of the, your father the devil. Well, when we were saved, our father became a heavenly father, God himself. And for the first time in our life, we had a choice with the ability to do right. Watch what he said. There's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You follow that Spirit that God gave you, that Holy Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. That's all that old law could do. It condemned me. But the law of the Spirit of Christ helps me to be able to live the righteousness that the Lord could do Himself. Perfect? Mm -mm, not yet. Let's go back to that other thing Paul said about his flesh, okay? Hang on to that thought this whole sermon. Verse number 3, For what the law could not do, it was weak through the flesh. God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Now watch this. For the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Let me tell you something. If you go back to the book of Corinthians, Paul's going to tell you something. He said, when a woman and a man are married, and one of them die, they're free to marry who they want to. They don't have to get divorced. Can I tell you this? When we were in the flesh, we were dead spiritually. When we got saved, the Holy Spirit came in. Guess what? That's what all we have. Now listen to me. What do I have in Christ? What do I have right now? I have the Spirit of God on the inside that separates my soul from a sinful flesh. Guess what that means? I am now dead to the law. See, so preacher, what does that mean? Isn't it cool? What's this? The old flesh is going to rot away somewhere and I'll get a brand new body. But a dead man is not under the law. I am alive in Christ and dead to the law. You know what I have? I have the absolute security of knowing that I'm going to heaven someday right now. Right now. So how important is that? Pretty important to me. But it's way important to the people who are left behind too. You say, well, I hope, I hope. I don't want you to hope, guys. I want you to know the day that I close my eyes in death, I'll open them up. Jesus said, He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I have a new nature. Number three in this thing, I have a new relationship. I got a new relationship. Romans chapter 8, where I was, you're, you're there already. Look at verse 14 through 21. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I, I shouldn't have to read any more of this. They're the sons of God. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. I'm not God's slave. Guys, listen to me. But you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we, call, we cry, Abba, Daddy, Father. That's what we call them. That's who God is. Jesus didn't say, when you pray now, you pray like this. Oh, mighty creator of all. You know what he said? You say, our Father, which art in heaven. Because we have a new relationship. We're sons of God. I don't care what gender you are here, that's the position that Christ earned and gave to you when you trust Him as Savior. The Spirit itself bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. If we're heirs, then joint heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, you so that we suffer with Him, we may be all so glorified with Him. Listen, you want an opportunity of something? You want something that I have right now that the world doesn't have? I don't care how lost you are. I don't care how... There is no difference between being... You say, I'm just a little bit lost and I'm part... No, you're either all lost or you're all saved. You're either all not or you are born again. 
I have that right now. Right now I have that. Being born again. That's what he meant. I have an earnest expectation in verse number 9. I'm waiting for the transformation. Right now you see, I'm, look at this, verse 20. For the creature was made subject to vanity. There's that flesh back again. Hang on to that. I've told you three or four times to hang on to that thought. Not willingly. Boy, do I wish we could get this into victory. But verse 21 says, Because the creature itself shall be delivered, also delivered from the bondage of corruption. I get to get rid of it someday. And then in this, I have forgiveness of sins. I have forgiveness of sins. You say, oh, what am I going to do? Guys, you know, I have a hard time forgiving me. It's hard for me to believe that the natural man could be as ungodly as the natural man is. And it's hard to believe sometimes that God would, would even love me. But He did, and He saved me. You know what He promised me? The forgiveness of sins. Bible says, by the will, which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Talking about Jesus, this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins, were ever set down on the right hand of God. He don't have to do it over and over. One covered it out. For by one offering he had made perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now listen to what it says. You say, well, preacher, I've been told you can lose your salvation. Read that verse to me three times and tell me what the verse says. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. You say, well, you've got to be sanctified. The word simply means what you got when you got saved. You got set apart. You now become a child of God. This is the covenant I'll make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their hearts and their minds. I will write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. How could you get, lose your salvation if God doesn't remember your sins? I have forgiveness of sins. For remissions of sins, there's no greater thing. Now, if you look with me in Colossians, I want to show you something. It says, the greatest Old Testament saint could only look forward to what we have right now. I'm not talking about when I get to heaven, but what I have right now. Look what he said, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind the afflictions of Christ for your body's sake which is the church. I made a minister according to the dispensation of great, the God which is given to me to you were to fulfill the word of God. For the mystery which had been hid from ages, from generations, but now is made manifest to the saints. You know what he said? We got stuff they knew was coming. And I'll read you the verse here in a little bit out of Hebrews. To whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory, of this mystery among the Gentiles. And here's that great thing that I have. They never got. Which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. That Holy Spirit seal. Guarantees me things the Old Testament saint could only. Hope for. Paul describing them said this in Hebrews chapter 11. These all died in faith. Not having received the promises but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed them that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They were still working for them. But we have it. Now what's the puzzle the most that puzzles us and everybody else? You listen to this? We have all this treasure. And here's the greatest puzzle of all time for all those theologians and all those unbelievers and whoever they claim to be or what they are. This is such a mystery, but it's so simple a kid could get it. You ready? For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We know whom we have believed. And we're persuaded He's able to keep that which we've committed unto Him. Just like Paul said. But here's the verse. Look at this. We have all that stuff right now. All this great treasure that we have in Christ. But look at verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Yep, that's what he said. 
It'd be like somewhere in the middle of the desert finding multi-million dollars worth of some treasure stored in clay pots. The container doesn't match the treasure. And that's where we are. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Why? Because God didn't want them to see us. He wanted them to see Him. Let your light so shine before God that they may see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let me tell you something. That the whole world may know that the power of this excellency of power that we see, this great treasure we have, it didn't come from George Newcomb. It came from Almighty God. And every Christian, every man, woman, boy, or girl who knows Christ as Savior possesses the treasure and the possibility of unlimited treasure. But we hold it now in earthen vessels. And every time you say, well, preacher, you know what? You don't have any more than I do and I don't believe in God. I got a whole lot more than that. I've got a hope beyond the end of this world, not, not counting the end of my life, I've got a hope of all eternity. You know what I got now? You want to hear it? I can put it for you real quick. I have God. <laughs>